All right. Yes, louder. All right. So, hello, everybody. Um, today, we're going to be talking about endangered languages in the digital public sphere. Um, for the sake of time, we don't want to um, oops, linger too much, but we just wanted to briefly introduce everybody. Um, so I'm Rachel Garten, and this is Marion Dale. We're with the University of North Texas. Um, we also have two co-authors who were not able to join us today, but we have El Somi Roy from um, the state of Manipur, and then we have Prafala Basmatri, who is from the uh, Bodo land. Okay, we're in, is it on? Yeah. Okay, we're not going to really do much with the agenda here. We kind of need to just dive in. So the focus of our research is to assess the state of the online writing culture of both Boro and Manipuri speakers. Now, both of these languages are still undergoing uh, continued orthography development. So what we wanted to assess is how their writing practices are manifesting online, specifically on social media. And we're looking at how this applies to their script choice and the factors that impact that, their, gen their genre and register for their written utterances, as well as spe spelling patterns, um, and any language planning or written discourse about written language that they might be participating in or observing. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit, um, don't want to go too into too much detail because this is a grapholinguistics conference, so you guys all know the importance of written language, um, but just quickly talk about it in the context of language documentation and revitalization. Um, but first, I just want to make sure that we're very clear on our use of the terms um, script, writing system, and orthography, since um, unfortunately, in a lot of writings on language documentation, these terms are used interchangeably and very vaguely, but we are using them very um, precisely, so we want to make sure we are clear. Um, so script being the physical implementation of a certain symbol system devoid of any connection to a language. Um, the writing system is when you have the language system now coming into play. Um, and then the orthography is the actual prescriptive use of that writing system. So which spellings from the graphematic solution space are considered correct versus incorrect. So um, having minimally um, a writing system, but also ideally some sort of standardized orthography um, is important for language documentation for a number of reasons. First off, it allows the use of the language in a much wider variety of contexts. Um, you can have menus, you can have books, magazines, um, publications. It allows for, um, as you can see here, that, that photo of the sign, it allows for representation of the language in a public space. Um, and then also assuming the script is available in Unicode, it allows for typing um, online, so emails, websites, uh, and social media, as we're talking about today. The other um, really important piece is that it allows for community involvement and documentation, which alleviates what we call the transcription bottleneck. This is where you have um, maybe hours and hours of footage that needs to be transcribed. And if you don't have any sort of written language that the community knows how to use, then the onus of the transcription falls on only people who are formally trained. So um, having some sort of writing system really helps uh, the community become active participants in that documentation. All right, so just some influencing factors quickly, <laughs> some context, sorry, I'm breathing very loudly in this mic. Um, first off, there we go. Um, as we heard a little bit on Wednesday, there is this um, almost like a spectrum of actual overt development as opposed to more natural and organic evolution. Um, particularly in the case for endangered and minority languages, a lot of times language endangerment sort of creates a pressure to take the more um, artificial and overt route to try and come up with something as quickly as possible so that documentation and language revival can begin. Um, so when you're considering you know, which writing systems, which script, um, what orthographic standards, there are different types of fit. Um, I don't wanna get too much into the weeds with that, but particularly the socio-cultural fit is very important in the context of Northeastern India. Um, script choice is very strongly tied to the tribal identities of the individuals in that region. As you'll see in a second, it's a very linguistically diverse area. Um, and so the, the choice of script is very strongly tied to, to somebody's personal identity and affiliation with their tribe. Also, just briefly, um, we talk about it a little bit more in our proceedings, um, but because it is a very multilingual environment, um, you do have interesting um, cases where you might have somebody whose native language is not the language of medium that they're taught at school. So their native script is then different from the script that might be used for their native language. Um, and so you have this interesting 
um, influence of potentially you know, a preference for the native script that is the majority language. And they, you know, people might prefer to write the minority language with that script due to that native script effect. So what Rachel was saying, this is a very linguistically diverse area of Northeastern India where we're observing these languages. Um, there are over 400 languages and dialects spoken in this area, um, among which 80 are endangered or considered vulnerable. Um, it encompasses four different language families and the two languages that we'll be focusing on today are both from the Tibeto-Burman language family. <laughs> and both of the languages are also considered uh, scheduled languages by the eighth schedule of the Indian constitution. And this is not the same as an official language such as Hindi, but this is more of a, a representative, um, they're, they're guaranteed representation by the Indian government um, and are often taught as a third language under their three language formula alongside Hindi and English. And the two scheduled languages, Boro and Manipuri, that we are observing are considered to be vulnerable despite still being recognized in this way. Um, all right, so jumping a little into more details about each of these two languages before we talk about our case studies. Um, so like Marian said, Manipuri is one of the 22 scheduled languages. Um, you can see here it does have a pretty high speaker count, but it is still considered vulnerable by UNESCO. And one of the reasons they cite is explicitly the fact that there has been so much script shifting throughout the language's history. Um, Meite Mayek is the native script from Manipuri, um, but in the 18th century, Bangla script was adopted as the official script. And actually many um, old Meite Mayek manuscripts were destroyed during that period. But then in 2006, uh, Meite Mayek was reinstated as the official script. So you've had this kind of back and forth with Meite Mayek um, and a very stark division now between the generation that reads Bangla and the generation that reads Meite Mayek. Um, Roman script is also used, but it is not official. Um, it never has been officially used for the writing system, and there's no orthographic standards around that, despite being very popular online. So here's an image um, of a Medipri text in Meite Mayek. And then I'm not sure how well you can see it, but some photographs um, of some, some preserved scripts that were written in Meite Mayek. Um, so now one of our co-authors, uh, El Somi Roy, who is currently in the state of Manipur, um, we have a brief audio recording to play where he'll talk about his own efforts to help with literacy um, in Manipuri, as well as um, give a little more context um, and background for the script. So hopefully this audio plays a second. This is Somi Roy, the Manipuri Learning Module, a story of Manipuri orthography. The Manipuri Learning Module is a set of digital documents in English and Manipuri. It is designed as a learning program for people in the arts and humanities anywhere in the world who wish to learn Manipuri. It grows out of Crimson Rain Clouds, my English translation of a Manipuri play called Asangbanong Jabi. The play is a work of art for radio and stage by the Manipuri writer, my mother, M.K. Binodini Devi, who signed her works as Binodini. It is about an artist caught between his art and two women in his life. The play is celebrated in Manipur for the expressiveness and power of its realistic dialogue. I developed the Manipuri learning module on Zenodo and later migrated it to the University of North Texas in Denton. Free universal access to the module documents are available for scholars and researchers on both Zenodo and UNT libraries portals. The module is made up of five parts, Crimson Rain Clouds, the English translation of the play, the Manipuri original in the Bangla script that Binodini wrote in, its transliteration into Maiti Mayek, a Roman transliteration, and finally, an audio recording of the play in Manipuri. One can therefore read the play in English or the Manipuri original in Bangla, Maiti Mayek, or Roman scripts. They can also listen to the play. Crimson Rain Clouds was published in 2012 by Thema Books of Kolkata as a two-language, three-script volume. The English translation is followed by the Manipuri original in Bangla and Maite Mayek. The two Manipuri versions were published on facing pages. The text of each page in one script corresponds to the text on the facing page in the other script. 
The reason for the inclusion of the Maitei Maik transliteration was because the general reader in Manipur cannot read this script. It was true in 2012 when the book came out. It is true even today. The backstory is that language activists burned down the central library in Manipur in 2005. This appalling incident was a result of growing frustration at the state government's failure over the preceding two decades to implement its own law to replace the Bangla script with the indigenous Maitei Maik. Their hand forced, the government hurriedly enacted the replacement. It immediately resulted in an abrupt schism in Manipuri orthography. And today, 17 years on, the below 22 generation can read Manipuri only in Maitei Mayek, while the general readership above age 22 can read it only in the Bangla script. The, the dual script approach of Crimson Rain Clouds was therefore to build a bridge across this orthographic chasm. However, the non-Manipuri will still not be able to read the Manipuri texts if they do not know or first learn either of these two scripts. To date, there is no official romanization system developed by linguists for Manipuri in the way they have for most of the world's major languages. So in 2015, I created a romanization system I call Mobile Manipuri. It is not IPA based. It updates the 1964 romanization system of the great scholar N. Kale Chandra with elements I saw emerging with Facebook, WhatsApp, and other social media. And I use this system to transliterate Asangbanong Jabi into Roman for non-Manipuri researchers and students of Manipur and Manipuri culture all over the world. A new publication called Modular Crimson Rain Clouds of an expanded Manipuri learning module with the addition of the Roman version of the play is planned during the MK Binodhani Devi Centenary this year. Okay, and now we'll talk really briefly about Boro as well uh, to give some extra context. Um, Boro, uh, again, is one of India's 22 scheduled languages, and it's spoken in the Autonomous Borland Territorial Region, or BTR, which is within the region of Assam, um, and has about 1.4 million speakers, most of them uh, residing in this region. And they have Boro medium schools where, like the name suggests, Boro is the primary medium of education, similar to an English medium school or an Assamese medium school. And the creation of these schools in the 1960s really um, instigated a lot of efforts to unify the writing system. So since that time, there have been a series of script shifts, Roman to Assamese, Bengali, and uh, in present day, Devanagari is the script that is official for the Boro language. But as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, Roman is very popularly used online. And this is just how the Boro text looks. This is an article that's archived in uh, UNT's Computational Resource for South Asian Languages. You can see it's using Devanagari script, but it's cataloged um, using a Roman script. And some images from an orthography workshop in 2010. So we want to explore Boro and Manipuri as they play into the notion of the public sphere, how they're writing contributes to the idea of the public sphere or a community made up of private people gathered together um, and articulating the needs of society. And we note that the emergence of the web and its iterations throughout the 21st century and the emergence of social media have really allowed that notion of the public sphere to take on a digital reality and um, enhance and create opportunities for many community um, and spe speakers of endangered languages to find community and connect and participate in language revitalization digitally. So to give some context to um, endangered languages being used and revitalized on the digital public sphere, it's important to consider Buzzard Welcher's 2001 uh, publication, Can the Web Help Save My Language, where she um, observed websites as a then really emerging phenomenon that were created by and for speakers of endangered languages and under-resourced languages to promote and revitalize um, their material together. And uh, since 2001, social media has become really a powerhouse for the digital public sphere, as we're calling it. Um, and we can consider a few examples from Facebook and Twitter that have kind of continued to answer this question Buzzard Walter asked in 2001. 
So Facebook in particular, the use of groups as a feature can be viewed kind of as a modern reimagining of these early um, websites for endangered languages. Um, they, they can be used to encourage discourse and question and answer, sharing materials from other platforms, and even enhancing archival access, which we've explored a little bit at UNT with language collections like Boro. Um, Twitter's another platform that's also demonstrated great opportunities for connecting speakers to one another through um, initiatives like hashtag campaigns, encouraging people to type in their language, even if they only know one or two words in their language. Um, it's been the site for case studies, such as Zapotec, another language that had a, a still developing orthography and a very underdeveloped digital writing culture. And uh, speaking of the writing culture, the researcher Brooke Lillehaugen argued that uh, it's, it's okay if the, the orthography and the writing system are not standard. Uh, in a case like this, it's kind of counterproductive to wait for something like that to happen to begin writing in the language, that you, you have to just begin writing and allow these things to kind of co-occur. So um, we, we conducted some interviews with speakers of uh, Boro and Manipuri uh, to discuss what they've observed and what they do themselves online, and particularly, again, looking mostly at social media use uh, as a domain for really natural conversation and more informal registers. So I'll talk really briefly about the trends we observed for Boro, and then Rachel will talk about what we observed for Manipuri. Uh, specifically on Facebook, um, respondents reported seeing both Roman and Devnagari scripts being used, but broadly, I think they felt that Roman was most heavily what would be used for typing. Um, and a main factor for this was convenience and the speed at which they were able to communicate. Um, one factor that they noted was an educational background could play into one's preference for script choice, especially if one had a borrow medium background and they had more training in writing in that script. Whereas if they were taking it as one of their third language from an English medium or an Assamese medium, um, educational background, they may not have that same in-class exposure to writing in Boro, even if that is their heritage language. Um, they noted sometimes that the formality of the topic might indicate the use of a more formal or the, the official script. So if a, the domain being politics or something relating to their language or culture, they might be more inclined to write in Devnagri if they are someone who might use both. Um, Similarly, they, they might switch back and forth depending on the script choice of a person in the Facebook comments. So regardless of the script they used for their post or their caption, um, when it came to conversing one-on-one, -on -one, they would want to match script with the person they were conversing with. Um, more than one person noted a distinction between standard borrow or really the more formal way of writing as opposed to an informal and conversational borrow. And the key distinction here being really word choice and I think this also, they, they indicated, would be impacted by the formality of the topic being discussed and if it was a post or if it was a comment. Um, and in terms of language planning or any meta-orthographic discourse, um, I, I think everyone kind of agreed that this was rare to see online, but there were some isolated instances of people reporting um, spelling uh, suggestions and decisions from the literary society and weighing in in the comments about their, their attitudes and whether or not they were going to adopt those um, and correcting people's spelling in, in some cases. But aside from a few incidences, this wasn't really seen very heavily. All right, um, so some similarities and differences with Mary Pretty. Um, so interestingly, even though the, the Romanized Mary Pretty is not any sort of official, um, and never has been an official um, writing system or script used for the writing system, Roman script was heavily used almost exclusively online. And there were a couple interesting reasons for that. Um, the first is, of course, just usability, the keyboard, sort of the processing fit of Roman is just better um, for a lot of, of users right now, especially on mobile devices. Um, also just Unicode availability because Mete Mayek, even though instated in 2006 is the official um, script, it was not available in Unicode until 2009. Um, the other interesting thing is the age and generational differences. So as Somi Roy mentioned in 2006, there's this, suddenly this gap between individuals who learned Bangla versus Mete Mayek. Um, so you have younger generations cannot read um, Manipuri in Bangla and older generations can't read it in Mete Mayek. So Roman is sort of like this unifying script that all generations can at least um, understand enough to, to converse online. Um, so 
the because there is no conventional, um, even really no uh, sort of orthographic standards for using Roman script um, for the writing system, there was a lot of spelling variation reported. Um, some interviewees just saying, oh, people don't care about spelling at all. They just write whatever. Um, but this variation is not so drastic that it hinders communication in any way. People are still able to have perfectly fine conversations. And there are actually a lot of topics, um, politics, social issues, um, a very active writing culture, despite this variation um, in the Roman script. So for the sake of time, um, we do have a summary of um, our findings and we'll go much more in depth in the proceedings, but for the sake of time, we're just gonna skip to the conclusion. Um, so just some, some larger observances. So despite these script shifts, um, multiple scripts used across different generations, um, this has not hindered the writing culture online of these languages. Um, also, what's interesting is that even though both of these languages have some sort of um, official writing system and actual official orthographic standards for using that script and that writing system, um, those are not the ones that are predominantly used online. So even though there is a standard, it is disregarded for the sake of convenience and other purposes. And we noted that despite having a lack of a standardized or orthography, this doesn't end. We, we don't believe that it will in the future hinder the use of either of these languages written online, which is, I think, in alignment with what Lil Haugen observed with the Zapotec on Twitter. Um, and while we, we aren't in a position to say how um, these, what, what's happening on social media will impact the standardization as things progress, uh, I think taking an assessment of what's being done and what's being written right now will be valuable as we continue to observe the way things shift and continue to evolve in the future. our references. Thank you. Thank you. So any questions from the audience? Yes, so we will alternate between audience and online because we have many questions. Thank you. Um, really, really interesting talk and very well structured. Um, my question is, um, less about your work and more inspired by your work. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, in, in my period in, in early modern Europe, uh, the way to legitimize a language um, or a, a vernacular is really to associate it with literary merit. And uh, individual authors, Shakespeare, Pushkin, Dante, are held up as, as the authority and the, the standard maker for, um, for a language. And, and that it gets prestige, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and yesterday in the keynote, um, modern novelists were, were pitched as more at the avant-garde, um, less representative um, and more experimental when it came to writing. And, and I'm struck by the fact that you were looking at um, social media and you know, a democratic um, standardization as it were. And I, I wonder what the place of, of authors and of literature is in these contexts of um, endangered but widely used languages? No, that's a great question. Thank you. I think you probably can speak to some, but I, um, that also, I think part of the, the crimson rain clouds, you know, having literature and kind of incorporating the literature in the language is also a big part of it, but you, I know you did a lot more work. I that. think that they do place a really high regard, at least uh, the four speakers that I spoke with um, and the ones who are using the standard Dave Nagri were typically ones who were coming from a literature or an academic background. And so they were posting poetry that they'd written or they were posting, you know, historical academic posts. And these were also the ones that people would be commenting, like criticizing the spelling because they were kind of being upheld as the standard and what's being visible to the rest of the world. So they, they want to make sure that they're spelling things right. But yeah, they're very, very visible. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's take an online question. Alvin? Yes, um, thank you. And uh, I, I mean, mean it when I say thank you for mentioning, especially um, that in the context of Boro, the formality of the topic is a conditioning factor in uh, script choice. Um, I've observe the same thing in, in languages on the other side of the subcontinent. So it does seem what you've observed might well be a South Asia wide phenomenon, but maybe that's a topic for another day. What I wanted to ask you was, you besides the formality uh, of the topic being discussed, did you notice any correlation between 
the length of the text and script choice. So uh, I'm wondering if, you know, shorter texts or Facebook posts were more likely to be written in Roman, uh, while longer ones, uh, were they more likely to be written in Devnagar? That's a very interesting question. Did we look at... Um, Not necessarily um, from the reports that we've gotten, and we are asking people to send us some posts that they've observed, our, our interview respondents, that we can include in the proceedings. But just from what they reported to us, it didn't necessarily matter the length of the post. It was kind of more the preference of the user. And even if they weren't using Devnagri, but they were talking about a more formal topic um, in Roman, they would also still be using a very standard form of writing. Um, but yeah, a lot of times I think it's very context dependent um, on what the script choice would be. That's a good follow-up question that I'm curious yeah. to ask our interviewees about that because they, they did mention the switching of the keyboard is a big part of it. So I wonder if you're kind of committing to a longer text that you're just going to go ahead and switch and because you know you're going to be in that, that mode for a while. But thank you. For, that was a very interesting question. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering because uh, it, it, there's also this semant, uh, semiotic correlation between length uh, and formality. So the longer the text, the more uh, the you know air of formality it has, which is uh, why I was curious. But yes, I'd, I'd be very interested to know if you have you come up with more information on that. Thank you. Thank you. A question from the audience. Yes. Um, do you think that uh, if there were uh, dedicated uh, input methods, such as uh, let's say uh, the Vanagari uh, virtual keyboard on smartphones, that could help in the future? Uh, have uh, the Devanagari script take over Roman uh, for uh, the use of Borough uh, online? That's, I'm actually really glad you asked that question because um, something that we didn't mention, but the fact that even though they do use Roman online, it's, it's mostly out of convenience and not out of preference. Um, so, I mean, as, for example, in Manipur, they were very excited that the official script was made the native script. So they would want to use it online. Um, I think if there were better input methods, it could potentially drastically increase it. Um, I know that on mobile devices is the really the hardest one because you have to not only um, you know design the keyboard, but then you have to get it developed and then you have to make it accessible. Um, there are options like Keyman and other tools on computers that you can be used, but I think the mobile devices is the largest hurdle um, for a lot of people. An online question, Terry? I wasn't sure if I could have time, so I'm just pasting it as well. But I was just uh, really uh, asking, wanted to ask about the social factors that motivated the Manipuri uh, reform, given that the Bengali had been used for such a long time, although I understand it was historically a, a political imposition, as it seems to create, effectively create a literacy schism within the society. I mean, actually, I had experience in about no, I think about it, it was about 2002, just after that, sharing a, a room with someone from Manipuri as a postdoc for about two years. And at that time, there was really, a, a from him, uh, my impression was it made, I, yeah, there was a, a marginal. It really, everyone was quite happy to use Bengali. It had been used for such a long time. So I just, was there just really a, a one political group that kind of brought back this reform? Uh, yes, that's a good question. It, it definitely has a very interesting history. Um, I guess before I answer the question for a second, just to kind of address, you know, that the people were very happy to use Bangla. A lot of people were, and I think it goes back to um, the sort of native script effect that Amalia talked about, I think, at this conference last time we had it. Um, yeah. but, you know, I, I'm used to this script while I'm actually uh, but as as Somi Roy in his audio talked about, there were a lot of language activists that were um, very passionate about, for, for purposes of tribal identity, getting the script back um, instituted. So I think that there were um, definitely different both social and political pressures in the region. Um, mm. We'll try to go into this in a little more detail in the proceedings because it is a very... Right. Okay, well, that's what I thought. Okay, Emma, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but... From the audience? <laughs> I wonder if there is uh, one big question uh, behind what you said. That is desirable uh, <clears throat> uniform uh, um, codification for, of orthography for an endangered language? I think it, it is not. I'm sorry, I, said, I, said, I missed it. I think it is not. It's desirable to have uh, a, a standardized uh, orthographic codification for a, a 
minority language? I, I think it's not. I think it's definitely difficult um, because um, as we heard on Wednesday, um, Melissa's talking about there's that time and use factor. And just because of language endangerment and trying to, to get as much documented as quickly as possible in a very very rapid, uh, you know, 21st century. I think that trying to get that time factor for the use is very difficult. So it's there is a lot of flux right now, just because there hasn't been enough time to really have it cement. So that's definitely. And our last online question by Logan Simpson. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just I I didn't have time to note it down, but I know you said something about a publisher for Manipuri, and um, I was just wondering if you know of well this publisher or any other publisher in this area that is working with um, like indigenous languages and like specifically printing in uh, indigenous scripts. Um, or any other like local language learning digital platforms? <laughs> yes, we actually, um, one for each language that we know about. So first off for, um, actually our co-author, El Somi Roy is the founder of the Amasi Institute. And he's putting out actually a book later this year, I believe. Um, and he does, his foundation does a lot of publications to support, you know, typically um, literary, literary publications of plays um, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So he, he has a lot of publications from his foundation. And then from the Bodo, the Literacy Society, you know yeah, more about. They, yeah, they're very active with that as well. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's a uh, Bodo Literacy Society and they, they typically will host uh, the orthography workshops. And then they also will help promote publications. Um, I'm not sure if they are the actual publishing house themselves, but they typically facilitate a lot of that. So if you search for just for, for Bodo Literacy Society, um, you should find a lot of a lot of information. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'm doing my uh, research sort of in the same area. I'm working with um, Tongsa and Wancho, so I might send you guys an email. <laughs> yes, definitely. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. So thank you very much, Rachel and Marion.